Before Sylvester Stallone became Rocky or Rambo, he was dead broke, living in a crummy apartment in New York. He wanted more than anything to be a movie star, but no one wanted him. He went to talent agencies over and over and over again, trying to get any kind of acting role. They all rejected him. They told him, you're stupid looking, the way you talk is weird, and nobody in the world wants to watch someone like you. Do something else. He went to every talent agency in New York multiple times, never got anything, until finally at one agency, he waited literally all day, slept at the place overnight, and was there when the agent came in the morning. The agent finally relented. Fine, we might have something for you. And he landed his first gig, a 20-second spot in a movie where he played a thug who got beat up. People are going to hate you. They'll like seeing you get beat up. He got a few more small parts like that, but nothing ever came of it. He didn't have a job, and it got harder and harder to pay his bills. His best friend in the world was his dog, but he couldn't afford to feed his dog anymore. So on the single worst day of his life, he went down to the liquor store and tried to sell his dog to people in the parking lot for 50 bucks. One guy haggled with him, negotiated him down, and bought the dog for $25 his best friend in the world, his dog who loved him unconditionally, he sold to some stranger at a liquor store for 25 bucks. He sat down and cried. But he didn't give up. He was all in on his dream of becoming a movie star. One day it was so cold because he couldn't afford heating in his apartment that he went to a public library just to get warm. He sat down and saw a book lying on the table. It was a book of Edgar Allan Poe. He picked up the book and started reading. He fell in love with Poe's writing. He loved the way the written word could move him. And he decided to start writing himself. Since he was still all in on his dream of getting into the movie business, he started with screenplays. He wrote a bunch of screenplays and finally managed to sell one of his screenplays for $100, which when you're dead broke and everything is going wrong for you, making $100 is a big deal. And getting your first sale of anything is a big deal for that matter. Anyway, one day he was watching a boxing match that was Muhammad Ali versus Chuck Wepner. Wepner was this white guy fighting Muhammad Ali, and he kept getting blasted over and over again, but just kept coming forward. And that gave Stallone the idea for Rocky. He rushed home and wrote the entire screenplay for Rocky. He sat down and wrote for six hours straight, didn't stop until it was finished. And he knew that he had something. He knew that this was his ticket. He went around to movie producers trying to sell his screenplay. Like usual, he got rejection after rejection. They said it was sappy, it was predictable, it was no good, which he, he wrote down everything they said and later read it in a speech at the Oscars. But he kept pushing. He believed in the script. Eventually, he found a group that was interested in buying it from him. They offered him $125,000 for the screenplay. You can imagine he was over the moon. 125 grand is like infinity for someone who's so broke he can't even buy dog food. So he said, okay, it's a deal, but under one condition. I said, what's that? He said, I have to star in it. I'm Rocky. They said, no way, you're a writer, you're not an actor. He said, I'm an actor. And they kept arguing with him. Eventually, they offered him double, $250,000 for him to not star in his own movie. He said, no. He turned them down, walked away from the deal. A few weeks later, the guys called him again. They said, we really believe in your movie. We're going to take a chance on you, but we're only going to pay you $30,000 plus a few percentage points of the movie's profit, which ended up being a great deal for him in the end. But they didn't want to invest a lot because he was a no-name actor and they were afraid to lose a bunch of money if the movie didn't succeed. He took the deal. The first thing he did with that money was go back to the liquor store where he'd sold his dog, hoping that he would run into the guy that he sold the dog to. He waited at the liquor store for three days and then finally saw the guy get out of his car. He went over to the guy and said, hey, remember me? I'm the guy who sold you the dog. I know I, I sold him to you, but he's my best friend in the whole world and I want to buy him back. I sold him for $25, but I'll pay you $100 to get him back. The guy said, no way. You sold me the dog. He's mine now. The guy said, no, there's no amount of money in the world that would get me to sell my dog. The guy left and went into the store. But Stallone wasn't willing to take no for an answer. When the guy came back out of the store, he just kept pushing him. Eventually, finally, he got the guy to agree. 
for $15,000 and a part in the movie. That's right, this guy is actually in Rocky. And the dog too, that dog butt kiss in the movie, that's really Sylvester Stallone's dog. I love this story because it shows one of the greatest secrets to success there is. If you want to succeed at having anything more than a mediocre life, you must go all in. I wasted the first half of my adult life because I didn't go all in. I wanted to be a musician, that was my dream. But I never went for it completely. I always had a backup plan. I was always afraid to take risks. And so I never succeeded. And like most people, I never went all in because going all in is scary. The problem is if you never go all in, you get stuck with a mediocre, unsatisfying life. You spend years of your life in a job that you don't like. It's hard to find a woman and the good ones don't want you. You don't make much money, you don't have freedom, your life is dictated by other people, you don't feel good about yourself, you're not significant, you know that you're just another average peon in a sea of average peons. You probably don't have kids, but if you do, they sure don't want to be like you when they grow up. Your health is bad, and you try to drown out your feelings with distractions like alcohol, weed, porn, video games, TV, and living vicariously through Luke Skywalker because your own life is such a giant disappointment. Most people are so afraid of the risks of going all in on their dreams that they never stop to consider, what are the risks of not going all in on myself? How many people have committed suicide or died of drug overdoses because their lives are so miserable and depressing they couldn't bear it anymore? The truth is, you can never avoid risks. You just choose which set of risks to take. And playing it safe is often the riskiest thing that you can do. Most people play it safe. But I have had the good fortune of meeting a select few courageous people who went all in on themselves. There was a guy I met in Tennessee who wanted to be a chef. There was a famous chef in San Francisco that he wanted to work under. So he got in his car, drove to California, and lived in his car until he got a job. Another guy I met spent a year living with hippies in a forest. Now he gives business seminars. Another guy from Finland moved to Canada to live with a mentor who taught him to start a marketing agency. When I met him, he was 19 years old and already making six figures. I wish that I had had the courage to do something like that when I was just a teenager. Anyway, I always admired people like this. I always knew in some way that they were doing something right, but I didn't do it myself until finally I decided enough was enough. I had to work up the courage and go for it. I won't get into the full story here, but the short version is I quit my job not really knowing what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to have my own business, but that's about all I knew. I saved a bit of money, quit my job. Three months later, I met a millionaire in my hometown and paid him $36,000 to mentor me. I went into debt, of course. I didn't actually have that kind of money. I moved to South America and lived there for the rest of the year, for almost a full year, because stuff is cheaper there. I was working like a three-legged mule every day trying to make something work, but nothing was working. I was going deeper and deeper into debt. In my lowest point, I had $70,000 worth of debt, mostly high-interest credit card debt. My credit cards were almost all maxed out. When I finally had some success, I finally struck gold. I created an online course for Excel experts to get freelance jobs using their Excel skills. I made $28,000 that month which is probably more than I had made in the previous two years combined. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now, some part of you probably already knows that you need to go all in on yourself for you to realistically have a shot at success. You've heard the stories of successful people, you've seen the movies, you know it's true. So why do so few people actually do it? Well, the truth is, everything around you is conspiring to keep you stuck. Society's greatest skill is destroying people's dreams. Everyone around you expects you to do the same boring, safe, mediocre thing. Go to college, get a safe, reliable job, work your life away building someone else's business, and then retire when you get old and enjoy the rest of your life sitting in a rocking chair doing crossword puzzles. Stay safe is the mantra of the COVID era. But basically the philosophy of mainstream society in general and why most people are totally miserable. They're stuck in this tiny little box of what they can do that's safe. It's like being stuck in a tiny little prison cell in their minds. So naturally, they're depressed. At the same time, 
the people who believe themselves to be the rulers of the world, and they're not really because God is always in control, but these people do not want you to be happy and fulfilled. They want you to be a slave, a quiet, obedient, predictable cog in a system that brings them wealth and power. You're never going to be happy and fulfilled this way. They know this. So they sedate you with drugs, both legal and illegal, pornography and cheap entertainment. The book Brave New World by Aldous Huxley predicted this perfectly. Of course, most people refuse to believe this, not because they're not sufficiently intelligent, and certainly not because there isn't enough evidence, but because they lack courage. They can't bear to face the reality. Like that guy in the Matrix who regrets taking the red pill and wants to go back to his old state of ignorance. But here's a secret. Everything is actually to your benefit. And I described that better in this video if you're interested, check that out. But you've been programmed to be a cog in a machine. Chances are your family and friends and teachers and the entire propaganda machine have convinced you not to do anything that they call risky or dangerous or irresponsible. But at the same time, all of the people that you look up to are exactly the people who did the things that were so-called risky, dangerous, and irresponsible to get to where they are. You might also be afraid to go all in because you could be disappointed or worse, humiliated. You would look totally pathetic if you really tried and it didn't work, especially if people told you not to try in the first place, right? This is why most people never go all in on themselves. If you try half-heartedly and you fail, which you will, then you have a convenient excuse. Oh, I wasn't really trying that hard. If you give it everything that you've got and you still fail, well, that's a lot harder to deal with. So what do you do? Well, here's a truth that most people don't understand. You've never really failed as long as you keep going. You get infinite retries, like a video game where every time you get killed, you go back to the last checkpoint and try again. Like Thomas Edison said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. Every way that doesn't work brings you a little bit closer to the way that does. As my mentor used to tell me, you either win or you learn. Every time you try something that doesn't work, it makes you a little wiser. You have a little bit more information because now you know that it doesn't work. Like a maze where you run into dead ends and have to try another route. You're going to run into walls over and over again. But if you learn every time, eventually you'll come out the other end where the treasure is. Or if you're like most people, you can just skip the maze and take the broad path to mediocrity instead. That way is easy. So why take the hard way? Well, here are a few little reasons. One, your dreams come true. Two, you get to have pride in yourself. And not the arrogant, pretentious, pride cometh before a fall kind of pride, but the quiet self-assurance of being a competent and fulfilled person. Three, you're much more attractive to women. And I'm speaking to men here, obviously. I am a man, so that's what I know. But I also know that it doesn't work in reverse. Right, women want men who are strong, daring, and successful, but that's not really what men look for in women. Men want women who are beautiful, loving, and feminine. But that doesn't mean that this isn't relevant to women. How many women waste away the best years of their lives on a career that they don't even like because they're afraid to put it all on the line for love? Because they gave in to all the people pressuring them to do what's safe instead of following their heart. This goes for everyone. Four, people look up to you, especially your wife and kids. Five, even if you don't reach your goal, your life will be much, much better than if you didn't go all in. As Norman Vincent Peale famously said, shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. People say that all the time, but not a lot of people really understand what it means. Here's the truth, you might not succeed. Going all in does not guarantee success. It's just your ticket to the game. It means you have a shot. But here's the cool thing. Even if you don't succeed, you will be so much stronger, more competent, more courageous, more skilled, better in every way than if you just sat on the sidelines with all the other people wasting their life away with beer and Netflix and Monday night football. And you will be successful eventually, maybe in something different, probably something better than the thing you originally thought you wanted to do. When you grow as a person, your desires change as well. 
My brother spent a whole summer in Iowa. He lived in Florida, working 12-hour days, knocking on people's doors, trying to sell them encyclopedias or something. I can't remember what exactly. Sleeping on someone's floor in a shared room with another guy because he thought that he could get rich selling books door to door. I and everybody else told him not to do it. We told him it was dumb and he wasn't going to make any money. And guess what? He didn't make any money. He made like $400 a whole summer, not enough to even cover his expenses. Came home with his tail between his legs, having to listen to us saying, we told you so. But here's the thing. That experience developed a strength and skill in him that he didn't have before. And he's since gone on to be a very successful mortgage broker who doesn't have to knock on strangers' doors to make money. It's like a law of the universe. If you go all in on yourself, you will be rewarded. Maybe not in the way that you had in mind. Maybe it's something far better. But if you play it safe, you're pretty much guaranteed to stay stuck forever. Okay, so now you know that you have to go all in on yourself. Well, the obvious question is how? Well, here are the st seven steps to going all in intelligently. Step one is to plan out what you really want. What is the most important thing to you? Is it money? Is it freedom? Is it love? Get specific. How much money? What does freedom mean to you? What does your ideal romantic relationship look like? Don't worry about how you're going to get there. Just get specific on what you want. Now, step two, what is the big scary thing that you have to do to get there? Do you have to move to another city where you don't know anyone? Do you have to start recording videos of yourself and put them out there for the world to see and the world to make fun of you and leave nasty comments? What is it? Chances are you already have an idea. Now, step three is what is the realistic worst case scenario if you do that thing? And go a few levels deep on this. For example, maybe you think, oh, well, I'll run out of money. Well, what happens then? Maybe I won't be able to pay my rent. Well, what then? I'll have to move in with my parents and get a job. What then? I'll save up some money. I'll get my own place again. What then? I'll try going for my dream again. Right, so whatever it is that you're afraid to do, chances are that when you look at it under a microscope and you really look at the specifics, you realize that it's really not that scary at all. Now, step four is what is the best case scenario if you do the big scary thing? So be specific, list out all the benefits if you go all in and succeed. What does your life look like when your dream comes true? Chances are the benefits are far bigger and more compelling than whatever silly little things you're afraid of. Now, step five is what is the worst case scenario if you don't do the thing? So what happens if you don't go for it? What are you not going to have that you want? What kind of regrets are you going to have to live with? What are you going to have to settle for? What kind of example are you going to set for your kids? Take this as deep as you can. I think you'll find that the cost of inaction is much, much greater than the cost of action. Now, step six is what is the best case scenario if you don't do the scary thing? So maybe you make decent money, you live in a decent house, you get married, you retire at 65, however unlikely that is these days. You get to spend your spare time drinking beer and playing video games. Maybe that's enough for you. If so, fair enough. But this step is important because you should make your decisions from a place of balance. Only focusing on one side or another is what leads people to make unbalanced decisions that they later regret. And then finally, step seven is to make a rational decision. Now you've weighed all the pros and cons of both sides. What's it going to be? Action or inaction? Make a decision. And then do something that commits you to that decision. Send that email. Promise someone that you can't bear to let down. Put down a deposit. Tell your landlord that you're not going to renew the lease. Whatever is the first step that commits you to action. It's like an insurance policy against the possibility that you wimp out in the future. The brave, courageous, strong, and decisive version of you just made a decision. But there's also a weak, wimpy, hesitant version of you that's hiding right now. But you know he'll come out sooner or later. Force him to come along whether he wants to or not. And maybe in the future I'll make a video about dealing with these different versions of yourself. But for now, if you need a mentor, send me an email. I'll put my email address below there. I may or may not be able to help, but I'll at least try to point you in the right direction. And you will be taking action. A small action, but an action nonetheless. Talk to you soon.